Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is officially, I guess, afternoon. My name is Connor Moran. I am delighted to welcome you all to our first educational series event um, of the year. Um, thank you for joining Madison Public Library Foundation um, in this wonderful uh, lunchtime Zoom. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am the new executive director of Madison Public Library Foundation. Jenny Jeffress left the organization at the end of last year and you might know me uh, from my 10 years serving as Wisconsin Book Festival Director. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you today. Um, and also, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Charles Franklin. Uh, I, If you do know me, you know that I am slightly obsessed with elections. So this feels like somebody cherry-picked this to be my first um, public event for the foundation. Um, as people kind of join in here, um, we'll just uh, welcome our speaker and um, all of you, but I wanted to say thank you to everyone on my staff for putting together um, this great way for us to connect um, and learn, and I want to thank everyone on um, our planned giving subcommittee uh, who has put time and effort into all of these educational series events. Um, you will see three more of these from us coming out over the course of the year, and so if you're interested in topics like this or you have specific topics that you'd like to hear about, you can email us um, at the foundation and um, ask for what you'd like. Um, so let's dig into today's talk. Um, we, As I said, we are welcoming Dr. Charles Franklin um, to talk to us about the Wisconsin vote, partisanship, polling, and public opinion. Dr. Franklin, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Oh. Absolutely. Um, and what a week to have you. It's almost like we knew there was an election this week and wanted to talk about the results. That wasn't planned. <laughs> yeah, so it seems, seems it to have been. That way. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Well, Dr. Franklin is the director of the Marquette Law School poll. He's also a professor of law and public policy at Marquette University Law School. Um, today, we're going to learn about the differences between statewide, district, and local elections in Wisconsin, party line voting, and nonpartisan elections, like the one we had just on Tuesday, which I'm sure everyone felt was very nonpartisan, um, and the effects of gerrymandering and political map making on state legislative elections. Um, Dr. Franklin, I, I don't know if anybody told you, I went to law school, I studied election law, and so this is just like the best way for me to spend a lunch hour. Um, so thank you so much for being here and, and sharing everything you know about Wisconsin with us. So. Well, I'm I'm delighted to do it, and I welcome questions in the Q&A function so that, uh, you know, we can get to as many of those as we can uh, towards the end. Um, okay, let me share my screen here. And if a miracle occurs, you're now seeing my shared screen. Yay. All right. Um, so I am going to talk about a variety of things, uh, partisanship, divisions, uh, rare cases of unity. Um, and I've already seen that we have some questions on gerrymandering and districting, which I'll largely try to address at the end uh, and in the Q&A. But all the maps I'm going to show you are ultimately relevant to the question of how do you draw uh, geographic boundaries to reflect the views in the state. Uh, but we did have an election just yesterday, two days ago now, Tuesday, um, for the state Supreme Court. Uh, this is the first Supreme Court election this century that had two liberal and two conservative candidates running. Uh, we've not had a case uh, in this last 23 years now uh, with two conservatives on the ballot in the primary. And the upshot of that was a much higher turnout than we've normally seen. 958,000 plus people turned out to vote. The previous record was set in the 2020 primary, and that was 705,000. So we were up 36% in turnout versus the primary three years ago. Um, you can see that Janet Protasewicz more or less ran away with the first place position, getting 46% of the vote. Uh, the two conservatives, Dan, Dan Kelly and Jennifer Darrow, uh, split the conservative vote pretty evenly with Kelly getting 24% to 
Doro's 22%. So uh, a little bit of a narrow victory there. And then Everett Mitchell from here in Madison uh, finished a distant fourth with just over 7% of the vote statewide. Um, that means that Protosewich and Kelly go on, of course, to the general election on the April ballot. And we will no doubt um, see an awful lot of advertising and door knocks and other campaigning over these next few weeks. Let's look here at how each of the candidates performed geographically. Um, Protosewich on the top left uh, did especially well in the Madison area, Iowa County, over to the Mississippi River and up the western edge of the state, and also in um, Bayfield, Adams, and Doug or Ashland and Douglas counties up on Lake Superior, a traditional Democratic bastion. But also, she did well in Door County, which is a place that's beginning to shift a bit in its politics. Um, and you can see in the middle Portage, uh, where Stevens Point is, and of course, Milwaukee on the bottom right. Uh, Mitchell did not get a high percentage of the vote anywhere. His best performances in Milwaukee, Dane, and um, Ashland counties. The Kelly vote versus the Darrow vote, though, on the bottom are really interesting because on the bottom right, you can see how Darrow's support was really concentrated in the Milwaukee area, um, in the Wow counties, uh, but also in other uh, counties there in the Milwaukee media market. She, of course, had presided over the Waukesha Christmas Parade trial, had gotten a lot of publicity for that, and that was especially salient in the Southeast. But you can also see that she did okay in the rural counties around Green Bay, uh, but not in Brown County itself. On the left, you see that Kelly's support is more or less a mirror image of that, not doing so well in the Southeast, not doing well in Dane County either, though they are Protosewich and Mitchell were gobbling up the great majority of the votes here. But Kelly had strong support in the north and west of the state, uh, an area that we'll get to in a minute, but which has become increasingly uh, Republican and conservative in recent years. Um, if we look at Kelly versus Darrow, this just sort of looks at the same thing a little differently. The purple counties are the ones that Darrow led Kelly, and the greens are Kelly leading Darrow. And those that are so light you can't quite tell what the color is are the ones where they were basically tied. Uh, that includes Dane County, uh, but both of them got very little vote in Dane. Um, and again, you see from this, Kelly's support in the more rural north and west of the state, her support in the urban and suburban southeast. Um, if we put the two liberals together, combine their votes for Protosewich and Mitchell, and the two conservatives, uh, Kelly and Darrow, then this is the liberal conservative split in the state uh, with the blue places, uh, the Democrat or the liberals win, the red places, the conservatives won. Um, and the darker, the bigger, the, the advantage. Uh, certainly, Dane stands out in this, as we almost always do in Dane County. Uh, but you can also see how broad the reds are how the two conservative candidates together, even though individually they only got about a quarter of the vote each, together they are winning an awful lot of the counties, uh, including the suburban southeast, the region around Green Bay, though Brown County, uh, Outagamie, and Winnebago counties are quite competitive in this, close races there. Um, Again, you see the Lake Superior counties with iron added on as light blue up north. Uh, and then a little bit of a surprise, St. Croix County over. One thing about slide sharing, you really can't see me pointing to these things all that well. Uh, but if you look over on the left of the, of the screen, St. Croix County next to the Twin Cities is usually quite a Republican area. It's interesting that it, it ended up being slightly more votes for the liberal candidates than the two conservatives. 
we'll see if that holds up as we go forward. Main thing I want to point out to you, and you'll see it when we get to presidential votes and gubernatorial votes in a few minutes, is the southwest of the state is almost all blue from Madison, Dane County, over to uh, the river and up to La Crosse. That's an area that voted twice for Barack Obama, but most of those counties voted twice for Donald Trump as well. It's an area that has shifted in a Republican direction in recent years. So to see it lean to the liberal pair of candidates is uh, both interesting and a little bit of a surprise. Uh, Door County being red, uh, blue here is also interesting. Um, if we could zoom in on, on Door County, you'd see that the northern part of the peninsula is quite blue, but the southern part of the peninsula is pretty red. So the county either leans a little blue or a little red, depending on the vote between the northern part and the southern part of the county. Um, in any case, this is a better performance for the liberal candidate than we have generally seen in close Supreme Court races. It resembles a little bit like the, uh, the victory by Judge Dallet a few years ago in which she won the state by just a little over 11 percentage points, um, and that expanded the victory. Now, I want to caution everybody that taking primary results and then trying to project them into April results is not a well-considered position. Uh, primaries don't necessarily predict generals, and so we want to be very cautious about taking these primary results as um, setting expectations too clearly for where we are in April. This will be a massive campaign, uh, spending beyond anything we've ever seen in a Senate uh, in a Supreme Court race. Uh, so lots can happen between now and April. One surprising thing is while turnout surged in the southern and eastern parts of the state, it seems to have fallen off a good bit in the north and west. Uh, I want to caution you that this is such a dramatic difference that I'm a little concerned that the data may not reflect the final total turnout from the north. Um, if it holds up, this is pretty striking, and I have checked it. I'm not just throwing it out there. But I am a little concerned that that looks like too dramatic a difference. So uh, be cautious about over-interpreting this. Certainly, the turnout surge in the south and east of the state was pretty impressive. Um, I do want to look at the uh, April election. And this is turnout in the April Supreme Court races since 2000. And what you see is that in April, we've generally had about a 20% turnout. Well, that's interesting because we were over 20% on Tuesday this week. So again, you would think that in April will be a good bit higher than that. The question is how much higher? In 2019, we were at 27%. 2011 was the in the midst of the Act 10 protest. That was the Prosser-Kloppenberg race that hit an astonishing 34%. So given how high turnout was this week, I would think we'll be somewhere between 27 and 34. Um, it's hard to believe we would get past 34 given the extraordinary circumstances of 2011, uh, but maybe we will. So stay tuned for that. Also, the two blue bars don't really count. Those are the years that we were on the same day as a presidential primary. And that presidential primary, of course, drove turnout way up and so doesn't really count for comparisons. One of the big things, and this is part of the partisanship title in the, in the event title, is the relationship between the nonpartisan voting for the Supreme Court and presidential voting in the previous partisan election has just exploded over the last 40 years. In, 20, in, in 1978, that correlation was literally zero. There was no relationship between how a county voted for president and how it voted for the Supreme Court. Those numbers rose in the 80s with a correlation reaching about 0.4 in one of those elections. 
Uh, correlations go from zero to one, by the way. So zero is obviously not much correlation. 0.4 is some, but not a lot. Then you see in the 90s, we get correlations in the 0.5 and the 0.6 range, though a few elections without much correlation. And then the world finally truly changes about 2007, where the correlation went above 0.7 and has stayed above 0.7 in every uh, Supreme Court race since, the most recent in 2020, reaching above 0.9 correlation. So this is the sense in which our nonpartisan court elections really aren't remotely nonpartisan in terms of voting behavior. People really do a strong job of identifying the liberal candidate with the Democrats, the conservative candidate with the Republicans, and then casting their votes accordingly, reflecting their political views. Um, but it does mean that just because we don't have a a D or an R after the candidates' names, that this is in any way a nonpartisan race. The, the voters uh, have that pretty well figured out, as do the parties with both parties now officially endorsing candidates for the court, something that didn't happen uh, in earlier decades. Okay, so that's that. Let's talk about the shifting patterns of voting in the state. Um, and here we have two excellent presidential elections to compare, two elections where the Democratic candidate barely won the presidential race, 2000 and 2020. Uh, the 2000 election was decided by just 6,000 votes statewide. And of course, 2020 by just over 20,000 votes statewide, both inside a percentage point. So on the left, you see how each county voted in 2020. And on the right in, I'm sorry, on the left in 20, in 2000 and on the right in 2020. Here's one of those things I pointed out a moment ago. Look at the Southwest and how blue that region was in, 20, in, in 2000. Um, you still see those uh, um, Lake Superior counties are blue and they're still blue in 2020. That hasn't changed. Um, and over to the right on the eastern part of the state, you see that in 2000, if you just sort of drew a vertical line for the eastern third of the state, almost every county is Republican except for Menominee, Milwaukee, and barely Kenosha in, in 2000. If you look at that same pattern in 2020, those eastern counties are still red with, again, the exceptions, though Kenosha uh, in 2020 went a little bit Republican. But look at the north and west of the state and how much redder that has become. That is a huge shift in the state. Um, if any of you remember back, like I do, when Dave Obey represented the 7th Congressional District, that largely that north and west of the state, elected in 1969 in a special election, um, and serving in the, that district until 2010. Uh, that was a Republican-leaning area, but Obi secured that seat for a long, long time. Now it's a solidly Republican seat, and you can see how the shifts in presidential vote help make it a solidly Republican seat now that it certainly wasn't in Obie's time. A couple of other things to notice is that the Wow counties, Waukesha, Ozaki, and, and Washington surrounding Milwaukee were really deep red in 2000. And they're still red, but not as red in 2020. Uh, just in the last eight years from 2012 to 2020, the Wow counties delivered 40,000 fewer net votes for Republican candidates for president in 2020 than they did in 2012. That shift, though, is not just about presidential or about Donald Trump. That shift also occurred with Scott Walker, whose votes were very strong there in 2010, but much weaker in 2018 when he lost. 
likewise for the Supreme Court races. So the wow counties are shifting not as distinctively red as they were 23 years ago, but that shift is largely outweighed by the much redder counties in the north and west of the state. And many of those have low populations, but together they make up about 26% of votes in the state. So uh, their shift to the to the Republican Party is pretty important. So this geographic change is, is pretty striking. You'll also notice on the right how few counties voted Democratic um, compared to how many counties voted Republican. Now, it doesn't matter. It's a matter of counting the votes, not the counties. But it does show you how much more the Democratic vote in 2020 was concentrated in a small number of places versus 2000 when it was spread out across the whole state, or at least much of the state. And even in those red areas, a lot of those red areas were pretty competitive, not the deeper reds that they've become since then. Since we wanted to talk about gerrymandering, therein lies part of the issue. Uh, if Democratic votes are concentrated in a small number of places, it becomes very easy for redistrictors to draw lines that pack those Democratic votes into districts that are 70, 80, 90 percent Democratic uh, and use the, the rest to fill out uh, Republican-leaning districts that are spread out across more countryside, but which aren't don't have their Republican votes diluted by the votes of concentrated Democratic enclaves. Um, here's the change in the margin for president over this time. Um, so this is really just the comparison of those previous two maps. But here, what stands out is how the Waukesha and Ozaki counties in particular have become bluer over that 20-year period. In fact, Ozaki, quite a strong shift in a Democratic direction. Washington County has become just slightly more Republican, actually, so not quite reflecting the same pattern across the counties. Dane has gotten a lot bluer. La Crosse and Eau Claire a bit bluer. Um, Menominee, very blue, as it has been. Interesting that the three uh, superior counties, uh, uh, Bayfield, Ashland, and Douglas, two of those have actually become a little redder. Uh, and so that also is a bit of a shift. And then finally, Door County, which has become quite competitive, is a little bluer. Finally, the Fox Valley, Brown, Outagamie, and Winnebago counties are quite pale. They haven't moved a lot. Winnebago, slightly more Democratic. The other two, slightly more Republican, but not a lot of movement over this 20-year period. Um, okay. Let's look at polarization in the state. And here's a good example of this. In fact, I want to back up to, I meant to point it out. Uh, look at the vote for president in, in 2000 and find Adams County a little bit. Oh, look, I can do this. I can point, I can point. Um, here's Adams County, a little bit blue. In fact, more than just a tiny bit blue in 2000. Here it is in 2020, quite red. And now I want to come back to the polarization. So here's Adams County today. That county that was blue 20 years ago is now solid red in both the towns and the cities and the villages that make up Adams. A big change over this period. And in the polarization sense, contrast how deep red Adams is to how deep blue Dane is next to it, uh, not quite next to it, two counties away. Um, and you get a sense of how much different counties can differ from each other. Uh, but it's not just at the county level, and this is something I really want to stress. Look at polarization within a county. So this is Brown County. Green Bay stands out as this bright blue city. Then some of the suburbs surrounding Green Bay are pastels, either slightly blue or slightly pink. And then as you get into the outer stretches of Brown County, you've got deep, deep red areas. So we often think of polarization by contrasting 
Milwaukee with Waukesha or Dane with Adams, for example. And yes, we do have counties which are pretty homogeneously red or homogeneously blue. But this picture of Brown County seems to me to be very striking and informative and raises the questions about political conflict within counties, not just political conflict across counties and across the state. Uh, it really is very localized. Now, you could look at this and say, well, that's just the urban-rural divide. And yes, it is certainly part of the urban-rural divide. But let's look at Vernon County, not exactly a major metropolitan area. But my goodness, you've got every possible variety of po partisan voting here. Towns that are bright blue, towns that are bright red, little villages that are pink in a blue field or blue in a red field. Uh, this is Viroqua, by the way, if you're not quite up on your Vernon County geography. Um, and so this is also an example of how um, polarization is going on in the state at a very local scale, not just statewide, not just pitting you know, one part of the state versus other parts of the state. It really is uh, within. There are very few counties that look entirely like Adams County. I picked that for you as an example of a purely red county. In most of the counties, cities and villages tend to be either a little bit blue or a lot blue, but at the very least, they're less Republican than the surrounding countryside. And that polarization holds up. But here in Vernon County, you can see that the towns and villages can differ quite a bit from one another, even when they're right there part of the same township. Um, so we do have this deep polarization. It does carry over. And it, it may mean that we're not cooperating as well with our neighbors as maybe we once could have. Um, so that's how the voting patterns have changed. How have the voters changed? And the answer is a bit. In 2012, when we started the Marquette poll, January of 2012, um, the state was about 31% Democratic, about 27% Republican. Today, it's about 29% Republican, 28% Democratic. If you put people who lean towards a party, they don't say they're Dems or reps, but they say they're independents. But if you follow up, they'll say, well, I feel closer to the Republican or closer to the Democratic Party. It's the same split. It's just bigger. It's 45 Republican, 44 Democratic. And again, was about a 3% or 4% Democratic advantage 11 years ago. So who has changed? Which voters have changed? On the top left, you're seeing party identification. This is the percent Republican minus the percent of Democrat within each of these four demographic categories for white respondents. On the top left, white non-college graduate men. The top right, white non-college women. Bottom left, white college men. Bottom right, white college women. And each of the dots is one of the 74 polls we've conducted in the state over this time. And the blue, purple wavy line is the trend estimate. It's a sort of moving average of our polling results over time. And the thing that just leaps out at you is one of these is not like the other, as Sesame Street famously taught us. The white non-college men have gone in 2012 from about a four or five point Republican advantage to today over a 20 point Republican advantage. None of the other groups have changed as much. White non-college women have maybe moved a little bit in a Republican direction. And you see right at the end, it looks like they may have moved a little Republican late in the 2022 election period. But overall, that's a fairly flat, slightly rising change. Certainly no, no, not anything close to the change that the white non-college men have. 
The white college men on the bottom left have been basically flat with some ups and downs, but not a persistent upward or downward trend. You can see that the group leans Republican. And finally, the white college women in the bottom right are a very democratic group, which has basically remained as democratic as ever over this period, but not a trend to become more democratic, not much of a trend to become less dem democratic either. Um, these groups together make up the bulk of Wisconsin voters. And where did that change in the balance of partisanship statewide come from? That top left group, the white nine college men. Now, this has been much talked about, of course, but I just think seeing it here is a pretty vivid indication of just where our political change has taken place. And also notice that that change was taking place since 2012. It didn't just start uh, with Donald Trump. It was beginning in the 2012 to 2016 period, has continued uh, solidly since then. Um, Oh, I want to also point out the gender difference, though. If you compare the top left with the top right, you see that women are substantially less Republican than their non-college counterparts. Uh, and if you look at the college graduates, the college men are pretty solidly Republican leaning, while the college women are even more solidly Democratic. But again, neither of those have changed much. So that's not accounting for much of the change in partisanship in the state. If we look at non-white residents of the state, uh, black party identification has been pretty flat, maybe slightly less democratic than it was, but only slightly. And if you look at that, some of that is black respondents who say they don't identify with either party. Uh, rather than a, a much change in Republican identification. Now, there's a slight change there. Uh, and then we've had a lot of talk about Hispanic Party identification and voting behavior. Our results here in the state are pretty flat, again, leaning solidly Democratic, though not hugely so, not as much as, as Black identification is. But we haven't seen a whole lot of change there. I can't break this down by gender and education simply because the sample sizes are too small to do that reliably. So uh, we have to look at just the general change. So where did that change in the map that we were looking at come from? In large part, it came because of changes in people's party identification. And where did that changing identification come from? Primarily our white non-college graduate men. Uh, who make up close to 30% of the state's population. So that's a pretty substantial group uh, to drive change over time. Now, people don't always vote with their party identification, but at least in 2022, in both the governor's race and the Senate race, over 95% of partisans voted with their party. There was very little crossover voting. It's the independents who can shift a little bit from one election to the next. Okay, um, issues. Where are we divided and where are we united on a variety of issues? Um, I'll have to say in part, I wanna push this point because I think it's substantively important. During an election year, of course, I spend most of my time talking about the horse race. Um, but I want you to want to assure you that we also deal with issues. Over the 11 years of the Marquette poll, we've asked 1,309 questions. The vast majority of those are about issues. Only a modest minority are about who are you going to vote for. Um, I don't blame anyone, but in our press releases, which usually run from 23 to 28 pages each poll, most of those pages are about issues, but most of the coverage you read and hear about and see on Twitter and other sources focuses exclusively on the horse race. Um, but I think this is really one of the most important substantive things we do, and I want to make sure that it doesn't get lost. So 
here was an issue that mattered a bit in the last election. How do you feel about overturning Roe versus Wade? On balance, the public is quite opposed to that. If you look at the TAN bar, 55% of the total in the state opposed overturning Roe, 37% favored it. But with sharp partisan differences, Republicans 72% favored overturning Roe, though 22% opposed that decision. But with Democrats, just 4% favored and 92 opposed. The purple bars are independents. And as I say, these are the folks that do shift their votes a bit. And they were 52 opposed, 35 in favor. And you can see over on the right, um, less than 10% said they don't know what they think about this issue. So this is a case where uh, we have a really sharp party divide. We have a hugely salient issue. And the balance of opinion favors abortion rights. We've asked a different question that I'm not going to show you about whether you think abortion should be legal in all cases, legal in most, illegal in most, or illegal in all. And the split on that is about 65-35, 65, 65 in favor of legal abortions in all or most cases, about 35 uh, illegal in most or all. That may have tightened just a little bit late in the year to about 60-40 or so, but not a big change. And over the 10 years we've been asking about it, it's kind of remarkable how little opinions have changed. Now that the court has struck down Roe versus Wade, we'll see if that shifts in the future. The other question we asked uh, in the fall is, should abortion be legal in circumstances of rape or incest, something barred under the current 1849 law? You can see 84% say we should allow an exception for rape and incest, just 10% say it should not be legal in those circumstances. And this is a case where you can see big majorities of the parties are in agreement on this. 73% of Republicans, 83% of independents, 97% of Democrats. There are 21% of Republicans that say not legal in those circumstances. So here's a case where you have big majorities. The majorities agree with one another. The question is, what political impact will that have on legislation and how we move forward? I'm also not going to show you these, but the table would, or the figure would look very much the same on universal background checks for gun purchases and on red flag laws, where again, over 80% favor those two things. And that includes sub substantial majorities across the parties. So there are some areas where uh, there is agreement across party. How about parental leave uh, require that companies give parental leave to, to uh, new parents? Um, I started asking this because I was surprised in the Republican debate for governor last summer, all three Republican candidates seemed to endorse parental leave as a policy. And I didn't really expect that. Uh, so in asking about it, we find that, first of all, it is quite popular. Overall, 73% favor required parental leave, just 18% opposed. And you see that includes 62% of Republicans, 65% of independents, and 95% of Democrats. So a little bit of a party split there at the end. But this is a case where there is a substantial majority for the policy across parties. And the standard bearers or would be standard bearers for the part, Republican Party supported this last summer. Governor Evers has now included it in his budget proposal. We'll see how far it goes. But this is a case where, again, there's some agreement among the parties, unlike in the abortion case. What about legalizing marijuana? This is a kind of frequently asked question. 64% favor, 30% opposed. This has worked its way up from about an even split when we first asked about it in 2013 or 14, I, I think. Here there is more of a party split with a majority of Republicans opposed and a big majority of Democrats and independents in favor. Uh, that Republican split, though, has been tightening over time among the rank and file, but again, um, not very 
not making much progress in the legislature. When we ask about legalizing medical marijuana, there again, support is over 80% and crosses party lines. How about crime? We heard a lot about crime in the, in the last election. Uh, this question is, do you feel safe or do you worry about crime going about your daily activities? And the big news to me is over there on the left, 77% of the state feels safe. It's not like uh, large substantial percentages are worried day to day. 21% are. And there are, again, only modest partisan differences in this. So to see the crime issue in the advertising last year wasn't reflecting people's felt safety, but was reflecting something else. But it is a little more nuanced than that. When we break down fear of crime and safety, feeling safe by region, look at the green bars for the city of Milwaukee. There, half the people, barely half, 51% feel safe and 48% don't feel safe. They feel worried going about their day-to-day -day activities. All of the other regions of the state are over 70% feeling safe. And so if you think of a pol public policy issue of crime, it seems pretty clear where that is concentrated and where policy might try to work to improve the situation. Uh, but it also means that trying to make people feel unsafe around the vast majority of the state um, doesn't seem to actually reach a receptive audience. People actually don't worry. Um, how about being punitive about crime? Make sentences more severe for all crime. Here it's sort of an even split. 41 would support that, but 46% are opposed, which you see a pretty substantial partisan split on this issue. Again, I think reflecting how the crime issue was used in the campaign. Um, what about increasing funding for local police? Here, most people are in favor of that. 78% uh, favor it, 95% with Republicans, 80% with independents, 58 with Democrats. So you actually do see a bit of a Democratic split. Uh, this would be an important thing, especially for the city of Milwaukee, if we found more increased state funding uh, for police in urban areas, not just Milwaukee, Madison, Green Bay, and other places. Um, this one maybe will have a chance of working its way through the current budget. Um, here's one, though, that I think is instructive and, and goes against some of the earlier results, and that is we've become a lot more favorable towards concealed carry in the state. When the issue was being debated and passed into law in 2012, there was a very close divide with slightly more people opposed to concealed carry than in favor. But in the years since it passed, support for concealed carry has moved up into the mid 60s and low 70s. So this is an issue where the public really did move and moved in tolerance of, of weapons possession. Um, you may have heard of COVID. Uh, we've been asking this since March or April of 2020, uh, was the shutdown of schools and businesses an appropriate reaction to COVID or was it an overreaction that did more harm than good? So we've asked it repeatedly over time. This is where it looked in September last year. And you can see still, despite all of the uproar about it, 56% say that was appropriate. 41% say it was not appropriate, but there's a massive partisan divide on, on the issue. Um, and so it's important to know this divide drives the political rhetoric around it, but also notice the balance of opinion even after we've had so long to consider whether that was an appropriate or overreaction. Here's the trend in that over time. At the time the shutdown happened, almost 90% favored the shutdown. That went down and has trended down a bit over time, but we've never come close to more disapproval than approval of it. Um, I'm going to wrap up and move to questions in just a minute, but let's look at another perennial issue, that's schools. How satisfied are you with the public schools in your community? Well, about 
20%, 19% say they're very satisfied. And another 43% say satisfied. So together that's 70, uh, 62% satisfied or very satisfied. 20% not so satisfied or dissatisfied. And 11% really dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. You can see moderate partisan differences here, especially on the very satisfied side. But there's not really as much of a partisan difference as you might expect, again, given some recent campaign rhetoric. I think this is important because as we talk about school policy, it's important to realize that a solid majority of our state thinks the schools in their community are doing pretty well. Uh, maybe not fantastically well, but at least pretty well. Um, what about paying for them? This is, would you prefer to reduce property taxes or increase public school funding? And the tan lines, of tan bars, 46% reduce property taxes, 48% increase spending. Pretty big partisan gap on this. But look at the trend over time. Back in 2013, when we first asked this, more people, slightly more people, wanted to cut property taxes rather than increase school spending. But then in 2015 and 2018, big majorities favored increased spending and concern for property taxes went well down. In the years since then, though, support for increased spending has fallen gradually support for cutting property taxes has risen gradually. And right now we're back to a very close tie between those two things. So again, that'll have some ramifications for the budget this year because school spending is a hardy perennial as an issue. We're always talking about school spending, but it is really striking. And let me put in a plug here. Why we've done 74 polls in the state is in part so we can look at this long-term trend in public attitudes and how those attitudes change and respond to events and respond to policies. And so I think while every individual poll is interesting in its own right, uh, these kinds of trends, I think, are really more informative about long-term shifts in public attitudes and, and what may come next. And this tightening of the gap between concern over property taxes and support for school spending is an important change since 2018 when you see how big that gap was. Um, what about public schools and private schools? We're going to hear a lot this budget year about increasing the voucher program and, and uh, uh, supporting private and, and uh, charter schools. 29% would like more money to go to private schools, but 63% would like more for public schools. A big partisan gap on this, pretty strong support for public schools. But if we ask the question a little bit differently, would you favor or oppose, I'm quoting, favor or oppose expanding the number of students using publicly funded vouchers to attend private schools. Now it's about an even split, 46-45. Um, pretty decent partisan split, though not as big as some we've seen. And if you ask the question in still a third way, do you favor or oppose allowing all students statewide to use publicly funded vouchers to attend private or religious schools if they wish to do so? Now you see 58% support expanding vouchers, 33% are opposed. So this is a real hot button issue on a critically important policy area. And you see how the way the issue is framed is really important for the answers you get. And in you, when you pose it as private school funding versus public school funding, public schools went out. When you frame it more as a matter of choice of individual students, voucher schools went out. So watch the political debate this spring over this issue and how each party frames this issue and how the, the debate is, is talked about. Um, 
Polling accuracy has been much in the news, and I'm going to just really quickly mention this. Um, in the 22 election, these were the polls. Uh, you see that the average error was off by 3.4 percentage points. The blue dot is me. Uh, we were right average in the governor's race. There were three polls that were closer, and there were five polls that were further off than we were. Uh, and the Senate race, we were off by one percentage point. The average error was 1.9. And there were two polls that nailed it, nailed the Senate race exactly. We had uh, Johnson by two, and it ended up Johnson by one. If you look at over the whole course of the Marquette poll, over there on the right in yellow is the absolute error. How far off were we? Uh, and the bottom, the average error, we've been off by an average of 2.2 percentage points. That was our same average error this year, by the way. So this year was pretty good, but it was no better than average and no worse than average. Next to that, not highlighted in yellow, uh, we've been minus 0.5 on the vote. That means we're a half a percentage point more Democratic on average than the vote has actually been. And you see the 2016 presidential race, an error of 6.8, our worst by far, and that's affecting our average. Others have generally been fairly small, uh, but as I say, the average is 2.2. So looking at polls, mine or others, looking at them over time instead of just in a single election is always a good idea. Comparing pollsters is the other thing. 538.com does pollster ratings for all active pollsters. They rated 493 pollsters in the last rating, and the Marquette poll finished seventh out of that ranking. Uh, so that's, that's a good measure of how we do, not on our absolute errors, which you just saw is an average error of 2.2, but how do we compare to these nearly 500 other pollsters? And you know, I want to be number one, not number seven, but I'll take number seven for now. Um, we're going to stop there and go to Q&A, and uh, I welcome your questions. Well, Charles, thank you so very much for that. Um, I was uh, just sitting here thinking I could do this all day. This is really, you know, kind of the uh, the pleasure reading that I do. I have like nine people that I'm uh, aren't here today that I want to send this to. Um, thank you for being so comprehensive. And um, I found so many of those slides, particularly that Vernon County slide, to be just like mind blowing. So thank you for taking the time to explain so much of what goes on. Um, and here Vernon in is not exceptional. There are many other counties I could show you that look like that. It's really striking how within county we have divisions. Yeah. I also want to say thank you for working so hard to get those um, Supreme Court uh, results already nicely put in a graph and, and you know, color coded and everything. So thank you to you or your research assistants, whoever, whoever did that work this week. That's me. <laughs> great, great job. Um, I also just want to, uh, you know, acknowledge the elephant in the room. We did dress exactly like today, and I, I hope everybody notices that at home. It happens to me every time I wear this sweater. Um, great minds. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, looking at um, some of the questions that we've gotten, there, there seem to be a couple of trends. So I apologize to anybody who wants the specific wording of their question at home. Um, but I'm going to kind of group a couple of things. So one of the things that we've been asked about a lot is talking about who is being polled and how you're reaching people. Um, there are a couple of questions about replacing landlines with cell phones, how it affects it when people have caller ID and they don't pick up. So I guess the first question is, how do you account for that? How does the Marquette poll um, get to get to people? I can do a couple of hours on this. So I'm going to give you a very abbreviated version. For our state polls, we've continued to use telephone, but we do about 75% by cell phone, only about 25% by landline. It has gotten a lot harder to reach people, but it, which is true. And I know everybody believes they never answer their cell phone. And but the point here is every call you should pick up in case it's me. 
If it's not me, <laughs> feel free Perfect. to hang up on them, but Perfect. I need you to pick up. Uh, and that's true because 98% of our dials are not answered. It's I'm not sorry, that number was 98? 98, 98 okay. out of 100. 98%. It's not that people are refusing to do the poll. It's that we can't get our foot in the door. When people pick up, 35 to 40% agree to do the survey, which is not bad at all. But it's getting through that foot in the door problem. And that's universal in the polling business. Um, I'd point you to that chart of accuracy, though, as evidence that despite these problems reaching people, we were as accurate this year as we've been on average. And in 2018, we were considerably more accurate than our average. So it's not that phones are broken, it's that they're very difficult to use and very expensive. In our national polling, we now do the national surveys online with a sample that's selected from people's postal addresses. They're sent a letter, the, the address is sampled, they're sent a letter inviting them to take polls, and then they get our poll and other people's polls over the course of the year to do. That's a very attractive thing, and we're experimenting with it here in the state. But the problem is that for a national poll, there are plenty of people that are in that pool to be interviewed. But in Wisconsin alone, we don't yet have enough people who've agreed to be interviewed to make that our standard. So watch for some changes as we go yeah. into 2024. But those are the two methods that we use. Great. Um, we do have one attendee today who would just like your personal cell phone number so she can identify it when you call her directly. Um, <laughs> we have time for one more question. I think that the the largest trend in our question is about, ger pardon me, gerrymandering, um, and, and specifically about how citizens get their voices and votes counted yeah. um, in a gerrymandered uh, election. And I, the, I know there are differences between statewide and district elections or local yeah. elections. I, let me just real quick, because I, I know we're about to run out of time. Statewide, gerrymandering doesn't matter at all yeah. because it doesn't depend on the district. So when we're looking at the governor, the senator, the Supreme Court, gerrymandering has nothing to do with those. It's the congressional districts, the state assembly districts, and the uh, state senate districts where gerrymandering is a big issue. We are, by all measures, close to a 50-50 state, but there is close to a two-thirds majority in the assembly for Republicans and just over a two-thirds majority in the Senate, depending on what happens in the special election in the 8th district in April. Um, so there's very disproportionate imbalance in the partisan makeup of the legislature compared to partisan votes for governor, Senate, president, and so on. What complicates this so much, one I showed you earlier, and that's the concentration of Democratic votes in cities. And so it's easy to draw a district with a very large Democratic majority. The irony is the voters in that district may be very happy with their Democratic representative. But by being very happy to live in a non-competitive Democratic district, you also make other districts more Republican. And since these lines were drawn by Republicans in 2011 and then drawn again by Republicans in 2020, 21, um, that, it, that advantage has been built in by design. This is complicated because the U.S. Supreme Court recently ruled that the federal courts will not adjudicate issues of partisan gerrymandering. They said in that decision that state courts and state Supreme Courts might decide those cases, but they didn't insist that state courts deal with them. So that decision, at least as of now, really cuts off the legal appeals at the mm -hmm. federal court level, throws it back to the state courts, right. and that's still a developing process. Yeah, and one of the reasons that Tuesday's election was so important and April so important, because they really will have the chance to decide um, or not decide, either way. Uh, well, right. Dr. Franklin, thank you so very much for being here and kicking off our um, educational series for 2023. There's so much to dive back into. Um, we will have a recording of this 
up on our website, uh, mplfoundation.org, um, in the next couple of days. So like me, you can all send it to your friends and um, share everything we've learned today. Um, I just want to thank everyone who attended at home. We love to keep these one hour and have you spend our lunch hour with us. Um, we look forward to uh, bringing you something more in the spring, uh, summer, and fall. So thank you all. Have a great day.